In this Star Wars Jedi Survivor news update video, I will be sharing with you a look at some unreleased content such as helmets, plus an indication when the next update will be releasing. Before we do get into today's news though, make sure you do subscribe to this channel so you won't miss any future news updates on Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Firstly, let's take a look at Patch 7, the next update for the game. It has been over a month since Patch 6.5 released, and it has been silent on EA and Respawn's end, which is just not good in my opinion. There was a large gap between patch 5 and 6, and then 6.5 came in to fix some really important issues such as the hollow map not working. It did not include any improvements targeted at performance. Those would be coming in the next update according to Respawn. However, it has been over a month, and only just in the last few days have we been given any indication when it will be releasing. So I looked at the Steam database, the back end of Steam for the game, and basically they submitted an update to the game four days ago, and now it's going through testing things like that. If we look at the past patches, when Respawn submits a candidate, around seven days after that does the patch release. So in theory, if everything goes to plan, this update will release potentially on Wednesday the 23rd, maybe a few days earlier, maybe a few days later, we just don't know, but that's speculation based on past patches. This would include the console versions, the Xbox and PlayStation versions, because they typically release either on the same day or a day before or after. One caveat though that may throw a spanner in the works is that Respawn did submit a new build for a PC patch candidate last night, which could potentially push this patch back by another week. So if it doesn't happen next week, that's because they had to submit another build that needs more testing. Of course, when the next update does release, I will make a video, so make sure you do subscribe for that. Now let's take a look at unreleased content, and this is all down to the incredible developers at Respawn. They have uploaded a lot of their work that they did on the game to ArtStation, which is an art portfolio website. It is fascinating to look through, and I've been through every single developer's piece of work, and there are some incredible pieces there. But to me, the most interesting things are the stuff that changed over time, including helmets and things like that. I made a video a couple of months back, going through the files and finding a lot of this stuff that never made it into the game, but it was leftovers. Let's get started with an unreleased jacket, and this is the Expedition Vest, which was classed as an outer, the work in progress text for jacket. This is an asset that was in the game. I found it in the files actually, but it never made it into the final game. Now this video does show off the customization screen in a early state. So as you can see, you have outfits, clothing, and then submenus for head, upper, outer, lower. So where the haircuts would be, we have headgear, and then upper would be the shirts, and then Outer would be jacket, and then lower would be pants. Then we have appearance, lightsaber, blaster, and all of this was in the same menu, so blaster and lightsaber customization was not on a workbench, but rather in the customization screen. And then we did have an appearance editor for cow, which is separate from the clothing section. And as you can see for the headgear, on the left-hand side, we have the Endor helmet, which I found in the files. On the right-hand side, we have the silver helmet that sort of resembles the Starkiller Sith armor that I also found in the files. And then we also get to see a bunch of goggles as well, various options. Just off to the left is a face covering, so that would have been another customization option for the head section. We also do get to see some placeholder shirts as well. As you can see, it has different text and just placeholder icons, things like that. There is also another look at this work in progress customization menu. Here, it's just a static screen, but you do get to see that it's evolved since then. It has the hair, beard, outer, upper, and lower without the lightsaber and blaster, but they've removed the headgear option. It also gives us a better look at the helmet as well because of the angle of the cards that display the customization options. Another menu that underwent significant changes is the ability screen. So as you can see, it's completely different compared to what we have in the final game. It's very interesting to see though. We get a glimpse of the pause menu looking a little bit different and overall it's very cool to see where they decided to take the actual menus in this game. We also get a look at an early version of the lightsaber customization menu, which is completely different as you can see. It's really cool to see this. You've got all of the different components on the left hand side. In the top left hand corner, you are able to see 
the text that says Sabre Design 1, it would probably change it. I wonder if this is loadout designs for lightsabers. I highly request a feature that just never came in the final game, which is a shame. One of the most interesting parts of this customization menu is the crossguard customization. So it's different. You can change the angle, that was always intended, but you are able to change the blade length, which did not make it into the final game. You can also see the kyber crystals were displayed like this. The workbench menu previously looked like this as well, so different to what we got in the final game. Now for some early gameplay of Kobo. This is going on the way to the observatory. You're playing as a cow, but you can just see how most of the art in this area has not been added into the game. It's all early work in progress stuff, and I just love seeing this. There is different UI, whether it be in the lower hand corner of the screen for the hood, or for the grapple, and on top of that, various objects are also very different, and it's pretty interesting to see Kobo down below as well. The Luca Hulk and other parts of Kobo have seen way more progress compared to this area of Kobo near the observatory. Now a peek behind the curtains of the hollow map before it was finalised. So this screen here does show us the hollow map that's somewhat final, but the icons are different. For example, Nova Garen is this lava planet. There is also a slider towards the bottom of the screen. This image gives us a much better look at the planet. So two of these planets are basically final, but the shattered moon is completely different, and so is Nova Garen. It's a lava planet rather than an asteroid. It also has Star Destroyers orbiting it as well. The text at the bottom from the artist actually says, an early version of the galaxy map that featured the destinations as discrete pages rather than nodes contained within a greater galaxy. From one map to another, we get a look at some iterations of the hollow map that BD1 is able to project. So you can see here different variations of what the hollow map may have looked like. Now for a look at some earlier UI for Doma Shop. Parts of the UI is quite different. It has tabs for Cal, Saber, BD1 and Charms. Charms being perks. That's what they were originally called. Text is different. For example, Santari Kree's lightsaber switch is just titled Republic Switch. Now for some more early gameplay of Cal and as you can see, this is on Kobo, we can tell by the High Republic objects and the bird. There is some text in the background such as distance length and just text above certain areas. As for the skill tree, the concept is the same but it does look quite a bit different to what we actually got in the final game. It's more 2D like in my opinion if you get me. It's not as polished but it's still a good idea, but the final version that we got in the game is really, really good. And I do like that they stuck with this concept and evolved it into something that's even better. But as you can see, it works basically the same, but a bunch of the UI is just a little bit different. There are some concepts that were given for the visual design, so you can see that it was revolving around this Zepho ball, one that we saw on Zepho that people really did not like to use in puzzles. There is also this earlier look at the skill tree, which is darker. It doesn't use the tablets, it looks more like a star map. Here is another design for the skill tree, which I do like this, honestly. It's very different, but I do like it. I like how it's got a lot of depth to it. And then we also get a look at the makeup of the tablet view, all of these circles, all of this incredible design work that went into make sure this tablet UI design for the skill tree did get pulled off. It's really fascinating. Something I wanted to point out here is that this image of Cal is on Starkiller Base. <laughs> you can tell it's Starkiller Base in the background. We've got a short video of an earlier version of Hollow Tactics. This section is called Hollow Bets. The UI is different. It's still similar, but again, different. We do get to see some characters in the background of this video, such as the Bedlam Raider just stood there. That definitely shouldn't be there. This is a look at the Hollow Tactics interface. So you can see that they've got a bunch of placeholders. It's a bunch of Fallen Order images, such as the Clone Trooper, things like that. They also are using a screenshot from Battlefront 2's collection menu of the Stormtrooper as well. Now for an earlier look at BD-1's visor in action, and this has the camera centered. I actually would have liked to have seen the option to potentially do this, and then we have the oil spray earlier version and the charge darts as well. All this UI looks great, but it's all different to what we got in the final game. 
There is a more refined version here, which is still different to the final game though, and it's just cool to see the different iterations the designers went through when developing this game. A feature I found before anyone else in this game was that if you change BD1's visor in the customization menu, it's changed his binocular vision. It had completely different UI, which was so cool to see. It was such a neat attention to detail, but what's really cool is that in this video, you get different visors that aren't in the final game. So these are just early iterations that didn't make it into the final game. As you can see, a bunch of these were inspired by the various binoculars that we've seen in canon before. Here is a look at some earlier UI for the Twins Dance being unlocked, which was unlocked on Kobo at this point, potentially, rather than on Coruscant. And then we also get a look at some earlier placeholder screens, which I've showed in my previous video on unreleased content and changed content, but that's actually seeing it in action. The interface for the Cantina Jukebox also went through various iterations, as you can see here. It did have quite a different design. It was more bland, I'd say. It lacks that purple outline and things like that. Just overall, the colours are definitely worse, in my opinion. As I showed you in my previous unreleased content video, when I was looking through the files, I found a screenshot of this jukebox design that had a bunch of memes on, such as Darth Jar Jar and Palpatine with sunglasses, things like that. And that, as you can see, is in action here. We also get a look at Cow actually using it in the game, with DDEC not actually being a final model. He's got no textures on him, he's stationary, no animations, but this is what the interface did look like earlier in the game. It also gives us a glimpse at Pyloons at an earlier stage. When I was going through the files months ago, I found various icons that were very surprising. Ogre's Cantina from Galaxy's Edge, the First Order logo, an icon for credits, and more. But this is all completely cleared up right here, because Danish, who is one of the UI designers on this game that created a lot of the phenomenal work, basically explains that this was all placeholder stuff when they were developing the neon signs for Coruscant. This was not cut content, that's why the First Order logo was there. It did raise suspicions as to why that was in the game, but it was made for various developers to go in and make their own signs, get to grips with these tools for these neon signs, but ultimately were not used in the final game, but they are left over in the files. Then we have a video of the databank UI that's different to what we got in the final game. It's different in a few subtle ways, but overall it's different, and it's cool to see, once again, how this differs from the final game. It does give us a different look at Kobo, the Kobo Abyss, and the Shattered Moon. They are slightly different to what we got in the final game. Then we have an earlier version of the lightsaber case for Cal. It was dark green, it didn't have the Imperial logo on, it didn't have the red, it wasn't white, it was all dark green, it was very subtle, and then they decided to radically change how it looked in terms of its textures. But as you can see, the design stayed the same, but they decided to go for a different look, which I do prefer. I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comment section below as to what things you liked the most out of all of these early iterations. Which pieces of gameplay did you find most intriguing? Let me know down in the comment section below. If you did enjoy this video, please do drop a like. And down in the description below are links to the various art station pages, all of the artists that help create this incredible piece of art that is Jedi Survivor and its design. Subscribe so you don't miss any future Star Wars Jedi Survivor videos, including updates. And if you did miss any of my previous videos, click on the playlist on screen right now. And I shall see you in my next video. Goodbye.